I would like to I would like to make a small contribution now. I think that uh, in American speak, before we go to the last speaker, uh, maybe just a short uh, contribution based on what we've heard this morning. We haven't heard as much about the regional environment and how the regional dynamics have determined uh, the bilateral alliance and how it has changed over the years. Now I think we have to go to the American t uh, speak and say we have to get over it. It's not special. It's not any more special than the other special relationships Thailand has with the other major powers. China, <coughs> um, Japan, of course, uh, even Russia, the Europeans, and so on, and the Americans. So one of the uh, number of uh, a clutch of special relationships that we have with the major powers. So we have to get over that. It's more normal. It's not special special. It's normal special. It's just a normal special relationship with the major power <coughs> of the day in the constellation of other major powers now. In the, uh, the de last decade or so, you know, the, the change in the vocabulary from patronage and patron clients to partnership actually began in the 1980s especially in the late 1980s when uh, we had trade friction, trade policy uh, friction with the U.S. and the Thais uh, were beginning to talk about how we're not a client state anymore and that uh, the, the, the word patronage entered the vocabulary in the bilateral relationship and it has expanded and now uh, what we need to do I think <coughs> is to really delineate uh, the strategic objectives of both countries and try to find common ground. Uh, and it's not the same objectives that we had before. So for Thailand, uh, I think that if we accept uh, that we don't want to be imbalanced, we don't want to rely too much on China and so on, the U.S. is still a, a, a crucial, if not critical, major power alliance for, for Thailand. For the U.S., if the rebalance pivot uh, is real and is imperative if they seriously go are going to follow through then they cannot do without Thailand. I mean Thailand is a, is a critical pivot, uh, pivot country really in, in mainland Southeast Asia and mainland Southeast Asia being a pivot sub-region for the Asian landmass and Thailand is a critical player in ASEAN so these are uh, kinds of the new objectives that perhaps uh, we, we have to start to face up to. Uh, it's not uh, old nostalgia and, you know, we have a lot of... Uh, I also miss it from the 1980s, uh, the good times from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, fighting the communists was a great time for us, but that's long gone. And now you look at the, the constellation of relationships that Thailand has. We sent more students now to China than ever. We have more military tr officers trained in China than ever. Uh, I met, it used to be that you know, we would have this uh, up and coming officers trained at Leavenworth in Kansas and once you go through Leavenworth you will line up to be the at, at least a minimum of assistant army chief if not the army chief. Uh, but no longer. So the, the US side they, they can increase a little bit but uh, even then uh, doesn't go that far because now Thailand is much more diversified in its outlook. So uh, one of the first things that I think we have to do is to start looking and confronting uh, new realities for, for both countries. For the U.S., it cannot do without Thailand to achieve its greater strategic objectives in the region uh, if it's serious about the rebalance. And the trade investment, uh, the shifting power centers and so on to to Asia is uh, are a phenomenon that we all accept. So it's something there for the U.S. to, to think about. And for Thailand, I think that we are in danger now of maybe becoming a bit imbalanced. We go to China a lot, Beijing a lot, a uh, little bit, some Europeans, <coughs> um, a little bit less Japanese, but all roads, many more and more Thai roads are leading to Beijing and other cities in China. And in the end, the Thais are not built and not molded not in the Thai DNA to be too lopsided in either way. Uh, so this is why we also need the U.S. in our constellation. So we have to get over it and uh, kind of uh, get rid of the residual uh, patronage overhang and uh, these patron-client feelings that we've had 
uh, still overhanging, uh, hanging over us. Okay, now, last speaker uh, will offer a, a view. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Titipon uh, Pakdiwanit has been teaching. He's a, a professor lecturer at uh, Ubon Rajatani, which has also an international affairs program, American studies program. Uh, he has been a long time uh, observer, analyst of uh, Thai US relations, US domestic politics. Uh, and most importantly, uh, we invited him here because he has work with uh, students and uh, people in, a, in the Northeast uh, who have uh, certain views about the U.S. and U.S.-Thai relations. So, Ajahn uh, your, your turn. Thank you, Dr. Tinan, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm actually here to talk about the perspective on democracy and how can Thai and U.S. promote democracy in the region because if you look at the promotion of democracy in Thailand, it also serves the interests of both countries in terms of economic development. And But before we go through that, because both um, John and Adantina mentioned about the period of the communist insurgent in Thailand, and this made me think because throughout my here in Ubon Rajatani. I have been there for, there for five years and have met a few people that make me think a lot about the ways we should promote democracy. And if you look at that time, the U.S. also um, tried to um, use the military power, which is hard power, to actually enforce the uh, suppress the, uh, the ex expansion of communists in, in the region. And I didn't think much about that. I thought it should be, it was the right thing to do. But after talking to a few people in, in the region who were part of that uh, group, the communist group in Thailand, it makes me think that if we, we actually believe in democracy, because democracy also talks about freedom of expression, and we should be free to believe and read and what we, we want to read. But at the time, this lady she actually she mentioned to me that she was part of that. And what she wanted to know, she said she wanted to read about the communism. She wanted to know what it was about, that basically what she wanted to know. But then she said her friends and people in the village were actually suppressed and they were actually um, as we can see that she, she mentioned about the, the suppressions from the Thai military in, in the region, in the province of Amnatura, and, and she had to move to China and spend in China for, five, for 18 years before moving back. And after she moved back to Thailand, and I'm not sure if anyone knows about the Santia group, which is one of the Buddhist groups in Thailand, and she visited this group. And the functioning of this group is reminded her of what is actually written in what she wrote about communism. Like, you know, you work for the community and the community look after you. And the question that she asked me that, she was wondering why the government tried to stop her from reading what she was reading at the time. And nothing happened to this group because they were actually doing exactly what, what was written in, in the book about it, in the way community can, can look after them. And, and this kind of raised a question to me as an academic when you look at the promotion of democracy and we talk about freedom of expression. And the question is that do people have the right to read in what they want to read or what to believe in? And I think promoting democracy is we can't just actually force it. And it reminds me of the system in Britain, I mean, the, the, the word that they try to use to describe democracy in Britain is like evolution, and which I'm not sure is in the dictionary of the US foreign policy makers when you talk about promoting democracy. And just this is a brief introduction. And when we talk about democracy, democracy and the three elements that we have seen and what both President Barack Obama and, and former Secretary of, of State Hillary Clinton mentioned, like they used keywords like democracy, human rights, and freedom of expression. We have heard a lot about this. How can we actually promote this? And in her final speech before she left office as a Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton said, America today is stronger at home 
and more respected in the world. And apparently we can hear from Kunika Wee really that this is um, whether actually America is actually re more respected in the world and people in the region are also questioning as well. People in GMS countries and people from Laos who were part of war victims during the Vietnam War that I have met, they are still questioning the position of the U.S. in the region. And I still think this is a point that's quite important to look at. And my focus is actually we are going to talk about the problem of stateless citizens in Obon Rajatani whom I have met and they moved to Thailand and during the war and now they they are still not able to access all kind of public services. And this is a problem that we should look at the responsibility responsibility between the Thai and US and to be fair to the U.S., I don't think it's just it's the responsibility of the U.S. government to, to deal with the, the human rights issue relating to stateless citizens in Thailand, because Thailand also benefited a lot from from the war period. For, for example, the money from that we have received during the war, as you can, I just show you this figure that we have, and if you look at that it's not just the money that just comes straight to the government and this is in a report um, in a book like um, painter in a truck or truck driver could expect to earn up to 24,000 baht per year and local wages in Korat at the time was uh, were as low as 1,500 baht for six months so we can see that we benefited a lot from, from that as well. So to be fair to the US, I think it's, we should talk about shared responsibility on the way we can actually promote rights and human rights in, in the, the region. And when we look at the case, I would just want to talk about the, the issue that I have discussed with people in the region. And one of the villages just mentioned about the, um, the, the reason why they actually moved to Thailand, and I quote, I worked for the U.S. Army as a military support in Laos during the war. Before I moved to Thailand, I always wanted to, to return home, but my children think themselves as Thai. They are Laos ethnically, ethnically but they were born here so that they feel more Thai than I do. I remain stateless, with no rights to access to the basic social benefit. And I think this is quite um, an important issue that hasn't been mentioned much you know, in the report. If you look at the report regarding, regarding human rights recently, like from Human Rights Watch, and most of the issues that we have seen dealing with the situation from 2010, the political conflict and the, the, um, in Bangkok, but not much of the report had touched on a couple small issue like this, which I think is important for us to look at these groups of people in the country. And indeed, actually, um, Dr. Nilan Pitako Chalapong, um, the Human Rights Committee in Ubon Rajatani, he also visited the village, but then nothing much happened. And this is just a picture from during the, the periods of the war times and the foreign aid from the U.S. If you look at this and when you look at the current U.S. policy today and since Hillary Clinton took office, she talked about smart power and the way we can use soft power to revitalize or change the reputation of the U.S. But then my, from what I have seen that the soft power can magically change the reputation of the U.S. in the region if you don't actually deal with small issues like um, human rights and the other way to look at the way to promote democracy in a different way. Perhaps we can see this in the way the USAID has been operating in Thailand by trying to support different civil society groups or different NGO groups and not enforcing it. But 
peculiarity, some groups still feel like being imposed or forced by the U.S. And but this is a question to that we have to explore how the the result of these two programs. And when you look at again, if the, the reputation of the U.S. here is. This year, we have seen quite a number of demonstrations and on various laws where the U.S. Embassy is located. And my point is that sometimes people just try to blame outsiders for what happened in the country. To some extent, I think it's not quite fair to the U.S. because if you look at the way the <coughs> we try to promote democracy, the key words in promoting democracy today is civil society groups. We can should promote civil society to be to promote a kind of pluralistic environment in, within society. And it is not just the U.S. that is doing this in Thailand. We have the EU or the European Union is also doing this. The, um, funding from Japan, funding from Germany is also dealing with this issue as well and trying to support different civil society groups. So when we look at this current political situation in Thailand and we have to look at in a bigger picture, when from my point of view, when I look at the way different institutions, different in, with the institutions from Thailand, within Thailand or from outside Thailand, international institutions or different country, foreign actors, foreign countries, when they support civil society groups in the country, I just think that is a way that we should see in a kind of positive way because in democracy we believe in a kind of pluralistic environment so the more groups the more groups are empowered then the more balance of power in the country would be and then it would actually help to challenge those who are in power and promote more transparency and democracy in the country and when you look again if you look at the roles of the u.s today the other point that we should look at is the LMI and the GMS, because GMS is actually in, includes southern part of China, but LMI is not. LMI includes Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And with regard to actually the que the very first question that the gentleman asked the ambassador about the the water issues in the, in the region, I think that is a good point for us to look at. But then again, when you look at the dynamic of um, change of power structure in the region or the study in GMS or in Asia. We have heard a lot about the, the roles and influence of America and China. On some issue, I think we have been focusing too much on the impact of these two countries. Of course, we cannot ignore the power of the U.S. and China in the region. But on some issues like the environment, we should also look at the roles of um, local actors as well, or country within the region itself, for example, Thailand. If you look at the impact of the environment in, for example, the Mekong River, we can't just keep arguing that we have to look at the dam that has been built in China, seven dams or eight dams now. It could also cause a problem. And the U.S., if you look at the RMI program, is it, is it actually trying to help with this environment, environmental issues in the region? But if you look at the roads of Thailand, we are one of the the cause of the environmental issues in the regions as well. And if you look at the construction of Chayaburi Dam in Laos, it's actually owned or invested by the Thai Thai Electricity um, organizations, and Thailand is actually buying and benefited from from the construction of Chayaburi Dam. So we cannot just bring big actors or call for help from outside and this is what the Thai government should also look at about these kind of issues you know when we look at the the way to protect the Mekong River it remains and a big debate even the construction is continued and the big company that is actually working on this project is Chao Kan Chang which is a Thai company as well and I think Thailand should also look at its position and its contribution in the development in the region. When we can't just say the call for 
support from from outside and this is I think it's quite important and the US can also support Thailand but the whole responsibility still rests on the country when we look at the development in, in, in the region. So we can when we look at the relation between the two countries I would actually want to quote this as a concluding part of my my presentation from Matherin O'Bright. Actually, when you look at the roles of the international donors or the way we promote democracy, I think it's quite a strong message that she, that she has written in her book. Like, And I quote, I also know that proclaiming liberty is far simpler than building genuine democracy. Political liberty is not a magic pill people can swallow at night and awaken by with all problems solved. Now it can be imposed from the outside. And I think this is what we have to think a lot when we work through the process. It is not just international, international actors imposing the idea on the people of Thailand. It's also people from within the country as well that we have to look at the way we believe and our belief system or the set of information that we have. And when we talk about democracy, we have different perceptions. And this is what people have to accept in Thailand, um, different opinions, different perceptions. And the most important thing when we talk about the future of Thai-U.S. relations, I think, when you look at the roles of USAID in the region, and what Hillary Clinton mentioned about the donors, when she raised the issue that donors should listen to recipient country and try not to impose because it would actually benefit the recipient country more if you listen to what they actually want for their country. And when you look, at, we look at the future of the two countries, the Thai-U.S. relation, I think collaborating and supporting each other is quite important. And But it is also important that actually we have to base everything on a kind of um, a good research if you want to talk about the promotion of democracy in Thailand. Thank you. So, not many new issues in Thai US. One new area that we haven't seen before is this donor cooperation between Thai and US uh, in third countries. This is a new area that can be expanded. Uh, now, I want to come to Kinkawi. You know, Thai, you said uh, that Thailand reacts to, to the U.S., uh, but at the same time, Thai-U.S. Re relations also react to the global environment, the geopolitical environment, and the regional realities. And, you know, we have a, a changing regional environment here. I think uh, South China Sea, you haven't mentioned, the rise of China, the, the disputes in the South China Sea, and the role of China in, in, the, in the world, and especially in this neighborhood in particular, this has a lot to, uh, to do in determining the shape and form of U.S.-Thai relations. Where do we f put, you know, in our constellation of things, in the Thai strategic outlook, where should we situate Thai-U.S. relations, the, the alliance, the relationship, the partnership, I think, in view of, you know, the rise of China, our proximity to China, closer relationship with China. You, you're asking a question like a, a thesis, it's like a dissertation, because anybody can answer this in five minutes, you know, we'll get a PhD. Um, my, my point is this, Thailand sit in a very Pivotal, I mean, very strategic location, especially in the mainland Southeast Asia. Forget a maritime security because Thailand is incapable. The next 22 months, Thailand will play major roles as a coordinating of ASEAN uh, China relation. That would be it. If Thailand can make some progress over the COC, that is great. If not, Thailand is not uh, doing that much because Thailand is focused more on mainland Southeast Asia, that's where its major interest. Thailand has failed to respond to maritime security initiative by many countries, including Japan. In 1988, Thailand 
uh, Cha Chai Chunawan proposed the idea to have uh, joint maritime cooperation surveillance of the uh, Gulf of Thailand and other areas. Uh, it was too fast, too soon. Uh, other country in the region rejected. So, if you look at the South China Sea, Thailand role in the next 22 months uh, will be crucial. What would be the outcome will continue to contribute to the role of Thailand in the future strategic uh, conf uh, configuration. Definitely, when you talk about mainland Southeast Asia, United States is very important, China is very important. How can we uh, live with the two uh, major power? And Thailand is confident, actually so confident that it has not done anything yet because we still here and they need both of us. The, the Americans, when they meet the Thai, they will say that, oh, you are very important, can you help us with the Chinese? And the Chinese say, oh, you are very close to Americans, you know, can you do that? So the Thai is thinking that, well, as far as the mainland Southeast Asia is concerned, why don't we serve as a facilitator uh, for China and also for US on the issue that uh, uh, regarding the region that can help. For example, Thailand was very proud of its uh, role during the Cambodian conflicts because you have China and United States supports the anti-Vietnamese resistance group. They work together to provide uh, uh, military hardware through Thailand uh, to have resistance group. So that kind of thing. But there's no really formula. So the best thing for Thailand is to I like uh, what uh, Titanan said, get over it, all these special relations, sit down. And I think the basic uh, vision uh, statement on defense is a good one because uh, it's focused on three areas, I mean four areas. They, they look at the uh, partnership uh, in regional security. This is the so-called new regional architecture, which Thailand saying that is this shaping by dealing with the Chinese, by making sure that the Chinese made progress on the COC on binding. And this is very important. Secondly, I, I think uh, uh, Thai-US relation uh, should be the stabilizing force in the uh, Asia Pacific. And also uh, using copper gold, uh, Thailand, interoperability uh, inter on its own and also regional. This is very important in the case of uh, disaster, relief, and other operation. That explains why countries like Singapore have moved very efficiently in coming uh, during the tsunami because they understand this kind of uh, uh, system. And the other thing is that Thailand has to coordinate more, speak more, open up, using the right people and uh, consult with uh, partner, with China, with America. I think it's very important. I, th I think we lack the consultative uh, framework. Uh, so we cannot communicate. A lot of time, the Thai leader just uh, imagine that uh, Thai-US relation is this and that, you know, without looking at the realities of changing environment. For example, uh, one of the complaints that I often uh, uh, hear is that uh, Thai-US are real alliance, but they don't behave like a real alliance. Thai-China is not a real alliance, but they behave like a real alliance. And other countries that have nothing or no status at all with the US have behaved in much better, you know, in strengthened relation in response to U.S. strategic need. So that is the reality. And I think it's about time Thailand uh, sit down and look at it. And if, if, it's a big if, if the alliance is a, it's a burden, you know, then, you know, just do something with it and move on. Because we have not yet really fulfill our ally commitment actually so it was a burden because every time you talk about Thai-US you know we get stuck because uh, 
U.S. always demand that you never uh, meet the commitment. Thailand will never meet the commitment of 100% alliance, not like the Japanese or, or the Korean. That is why it has not been upgraded since uh, 1962, Tanat Dinras. Japan, Korea have already uh, upgraded. Uh, in case of Japan, it's uh, not only bilateral, it has implications for, for the region, for the security in East Asia. And I think Thailand should do that. And Thailand can only do that if our uh, defense uh, security sector do their homework and come up with initiative, you know, respond, put up the idea uh, with the US. And you have to get good people, you know. Communicate in English, please. Okay, th thank you. Great. Now, the floor is open to questions, comments. Take one from Basabah Fitz. But sharpen it through, say, a thought experiment in the region. Two years ago, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, uh, wrote her article in Foreign Policy, which, kicked, which the, the U.S. first articulated its pivot to Asia, rebalancing to Asia. Re it, it indicated an interest in diplomatic, economic, security increases in its relations with Asia. If you look around the region, um, since then, of course, there is the dramatic opening with Myanmar. Indo U.S. relations with Indonesia have become more and more solid as more and more programs uh, develop, particularly with the military. Um, as you noted, uh, the, the situation, the relations with Laos have been normalized. Even with Cambodia, there are increased programs. Uh, and yet we get, as uh, Ajahn Titinan said, a sense when we talk about the U.S.-Thai relationship, it just isn't what it was. Now, um, John Brandon mentioned that the words U.S. is distracted in the Middle East, um, that most countries don't want to get uh, caught between China and the U.S., but that certainly applies to the countries in the region, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, that are discussing the TPP. They're interested in a, an expanded relationship with the U.S., but they don't want to get caught between uh, China and the U.S., quite rightly. So why is there a sense in this thought experiment of malaise, no movement, whereas if you had this seminar in most of the countries in the region, you'd be talking about something new, recent, and exciting? I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one which both uh, Goey and, and I mentioned before and you just mentioned in your question about Thailand doesn't want to get caught between the United States and, uh, and, and China. They don't want to seem to want to, you know, offend. I mean, the, uh, so, uh, you know, I think Goey, you were saying that, uh, you know, the United States talks to Thailand and says, oh, you know, we need you to help us with China and China says the same thing about us and I guess maybe that helps to make Thailand, you know, Thailand feel good and that it has a pivotal role, but what does it do about that? And that I think is is unclear. And um, you know, from talking to um, to policymakers in Washington, uh, and they they have used this one particular word. So I take it that this must be a word that goes around in, in meetings that I am not privy to. But that move that word is perplexed. They don't know how to handle Thailand. And let me use as an example, you know, in terms of the alliance, all right, we still have an alliance, we have this largest military exercise with, with Cobra Gold, but we, um, at the same time, there was a, a report that came out um, uh, less than a year ago uh, by the Center for New American Security. And their keynote speaker was um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Admiral uh, Greener. He's the um, the chief of U.S. Naval Operations, and he talked about the importance of alliance uh, of, of alliances in Asia to promote um, uh, to, uh, to promote security and secure sea lines of communication in throughout the Asia Pacific region. And when talking about the alliances, he said first, and he ranked them. He ranked Japan as number one. Uh, he ranked um, uh, South Korea as number two. Uh, he then went to Australia, and then he ranked the Philippines fourth. Now you could say Thailand would be number five, and I guess by default that would be true. But the fact is, is that he didn't even mention Thailand at all. He talked about those four alliances and nothing else. 
and and so uh, maybe this uh, explains uh, at least somewhat in part about uh, officials uh, being perplexed. But let's look at those, at least three of those alliances, the ones that are immediately in Asia, and let's exclude Australia for the moment. If you look at um, uh, Japan, well, what is the, what is the threat? Well, um, China and, and, and North Korea. Uh, what is the threat for South Korea? North Korea. Uh, for the Philippines, particularly over the last uh, couple of years with tensions and uh, disputed waters in the Ch South China Sea, it's China. So where do we have Thailand? Um, you know, during the Cold War, this was a, you know, a frontline state in the war against communism. That was the threat. Uh, China is no longer a, a threat today, uh, and uh, Vietnam is uh, a threat. This is a, you know, by and large, uh, despite some Subnational uh, conflicts. It's a, it's a, you know it's a stable uh, it's a stable region. So this is in, in one sense now an uh, an enemy depraved um, alliance in in that respect. So I think that uh, is part of the you know part of the challenge uh, in uh, in regards to that. Um, what was the other part? You had another part to that, Bob? Or well, the main part was why in every country in the region, and I'll include Indonesia because that sort of refutes what your point you just made, is there a sense of real momentum and interest in the U.S. relationship, whereas there is a sense of ennui uh, here? A sense of what? Uh, I was using ennui, uh, just uh, oh. boredom. Oh, yeah. Um, the. Um well, and yes, there are other countries that have improved their, their it's not an alliance per, uh, per se, but uh, s certainly security relationships have been strengthened with Vietnam, Singapore, it's always been, been strong, and, and uh, in Indonesia they just purchased the, uh, the Apache helicopters. While it's close to it, they're having these naval um, um, maneuvers uh, um, near the uh, Natuna Islands, uh, you know, that's to secure Indonesian waters, but at the same time, I think that's a reflection of Indonesia also wanting to be uh, a regional power and, and, and to um, take a, a larger role, not just in ASEAN, but on the, on the world stage. Um, go ahead, go. Uh, uh, thank you, Bob. I, I think one of the uh, two reasons is that uh, uh, Thailand doesn't feel the immediate threat that every other neighboring country concerned emanating come uh, from the U.S. rebalancing. I mentioned earlier about maritime security. Thailand does not feel that way. So it does not respond to the private to Asia, which is essentially briefing up U.S. positions in the uh, South China Sea. That, that's one of uh, the explanation. Secondly, I think Thailand lacked the kind of uh, strategic thinking because if you uh, understand the Thai psyche, you know, if things ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't even try. Preventive diplomacy, are you crazy? We Thai, we solve it when it happened. So that kind of attitude is I mean, I mean, it's not fair to really generalize, but it does have some relevance in the way we look at problem. So when we look at the U.S., great, you know, we are sure aligned. So I, why, why think about it? You know, it it will move on. It's slow. Let other people try it. We have good time with China. Fine with Japan. You know, fine. We are all good friends to all country. But suddenly, in recent months especially at the end of last year. Something has changed in Thai foreign policy. I hope if you follow newspaper, you will realize that Thailand suddenly have a very active foreign policy, even though our foreign policy leader are not capable of conducting foreign policy. Oh, it's true, it's true. Why? Because it realized that Domestic issue has dominated the foreign policy. Why don't just highlight it in the foreign policy? So for the first time, Thailand recognized in our history that we do not sit on the fence. We made our early decisions to recognize the anti Assad resistant force. And Thailand very proud. And at the end of the report of uh, foreign ministry, it said that we have changed because we make a decision on supporting the 
Syrian resistant group. That's number one. Number two, another strange thing uh, happened. You will see that Thailand suddenly fall in love with international so-called facilitator, not yet mediator, expert views on domestic politics. In the past, these people are considered taboo because we lack the leader who can express themselves you know, on the domestic issue to global communities. So we ask global leader to come to Thailand to express their view on local issues. This is something changed and now it has become an epidemic. Next year, Thailand will invite all the African leaders to have a meeting. Are you ready to have a meeting, summit leading, high level meetings in February? Maybe you didn't know. This is something new. Suddenly, Thailand want to expand its foreign policy. I don't know whether they think strategically, but I don't think so because Thailand always respond to crisis uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. If we think more than one day, you know, the whole country collapse. So having said that, I think on the element of the Thai US, the most important is we lack the strategic element. Maybe it has to do with our enemies. Vietnam respond very well. Philippines respond very well. You know, Australia will respond very well. Thailand does not. Even though it has a good friend waiting, we does not respond. Why should we? We are a peaceful country. We are all friends to all. I mean, that's my, my, my explanation. But this will change if uh, somehow next year, uh, the dialogue 2 plus 2 framework uh, will kickstart. And unfortunately, uh, in the case of Philippines, in the case of other airlines, it starts out as the ministerial level. It's unfortunately for the Thai, it has to start at the lower level because our leader are incapable of carrying out the conversation, so it will start at permanent sec level, senior official level. I think that would be a very good start to, to answer this question. There seems to also be uh, some correlation between the countries that have uh, tension with China and countries that don't have as much tension with China. So the maritime countries, if you look at if this seminar were taking place in Jakarta or Manila uh, or even Hanoi, uh, there would be more spark and there would be it would generate more buzz but in bangkok we have not really that kind of tension and problems with uh, with the chinese uh, so that seems to be uh, some correlation between maritime and this would be similar also for cambodia and myanmar and laos they wouldn't uh, have so many problems with china as well the other thing is um, you know the absence of ideology i think has a lot to do with it there's no more communism. But Thailand is also not in the business of promoting, not officially in the business of uh, promoting democracy and human rights. I mean, it's not a common ideological agenda that the US has. So the, the ground on ideology and ideas uh, is also not uh, what it used to be doing uh, as it was during the Cold War. And, you know, Ambassador Kenny mentioned geography. I think geography has a lot to do with it. If you look at uh, the current Thai foreign policy movements, uh, they it seem to be driven much more by a calculation of uh, interests uh, based on geographical uh, underpinning. We are talking about the Thailand. Could, could you please, uh, your English is fine, it's great. Please tell us your, your name. Archie Wayne Chow from the Federation of Thai Industries. This morning we are talking about Thailand and the U.S. relation, which is not uh, on the on the on the back. Uh, on the board, but we have been talking the whole morning without finding any uh, truly meaningful adjective of that relation, except from Dr. Tinan mentioning it's very good. Uh, Mr. Brandon was questioning how important and how meaningful it is. Having lived almost 70 years, so that is more than one third of the 180 years, I can only say that I am grateful and thankful to the U.S. for helping me to learn the first word 
of liberty when I was very small. That was before democracy was being uh, promoted among the Thais. And lately with the democracy, we are becoming more and more democratic to the extent that we cannot be happy with ourselves. And we tend now to be the expert in criticism rather than anything else. So I would say that the U.S. Thai relation, to me at least, that has been very helpful and that, therefore it is very meaningful. Maybe it's not the best relationship that we have, but that is the best we can have. Thank you very much. Another point is we need to assess when we are talking about partnership and alliance. So what do the two countries expect of their partner and how do they perceive the role of their partner? Are they up to their expectation? Thank you very much. You mentioned uh, the grip and jets is one thing that uh, you were disappointed that the U.S. doesn't help provide military equipment, but Sweden does and some other things. But to bring up some other points, you, you look at the other purchases, for instance, blimps, submarines, uh, bomb detectors. Uh, the, do you think anything with, uh, I hate to use this word, corruption, uh, might have something to do with why U.S. doesn't provide some of these things? Um, I totally agree. 180 years relationship is something more than special, something we should uh, try to nurture uh, into something more uh, with prosperity. Uh, don't talk about uh, Asian crisis. I'd like to uh, uh, share some view on, on Thailand crisis. That is the worst crisis in Thailand, the most difficulty, difficult time in Thai modern history. Um, of course, Thailand, Thai people had endowed in some sins, but eventually uh, Thai people pay dearly, painfully more than the sin that they have committed. Um, uh, I heard about the constraints of President Clinton and also uh, Bob Rubin at that time, um, but um, you know, we, Thailand got 17 billion from IMF. Uh, a few months later, much bigger amount go, went to Indonesia and Korea, much, much bigger amount. And uh, to put 17 billion in perspective, today, every month, Federal Reserve actually paid 85 billion every month. So 17 billion actually uh, not much uh, from uh, superpower. The the my my, my view is although Thailand had committed a sin, but the catalyst, the trigger, actually came from hedge fund uh, uh, to uh, to uh, trigger all this problem. And the hedge fund, besides trickling it, also make it worse and actually exacerbate the the pain. Uh, and most of the hedge fund money actually came from the U.S. Um, subsequently, uh, on the restructuring, um, the U.S. money actually helped restructuring uh, Thailand when Thailand was forced to sell the, the asset at five several prices. Um, my, my question to the panelists is, besides the constraints that uh, John mentioned, uh, what are the reasons behind the lack of energy uh, from the administration to push for, um, for something uh, that is quite important for strategic partner like Thailand, and especially during the time when China was rising. Uh, that is an opportunity to show goodwill uh, to the region. That brings to the second question. Uh, if Thailand continue to and did, are doing more uh, wrong economic policy, uh, putting Thailand at more economic risk and more vulnerability. And if some perfect storm happen in the future, what can we do to convince uh, Uncle Sam to, to exist more in the future? Thank you. The question about uh from Kun Panya, from a private sector of finance uh, banking, perhaps John, you can elaborate 
is this the enemy, the, the 1997 lack of response from the U.S. is really deeply scarred in the Thai kind of uh, collective psyche. Uh, and, you know, in, I think the package eventually was 14.5 billion for us, 4 billion from the IMF, uh, and then China 1 billion, Japan 4 billion from Japan, and so on. Uh, three years before that, they, I think 33 billion U.S. Uh, bailed out Mexico. And then after that, uh, Indonesia and South Korea got much bigger packages. So this is something we still kind of hung up about, you can imagine, right? And then if we have another storm, and now they're talking about this so-called perfect storm, I think we have a lot more Im immunity now with uh, the, the macroeconomic balances, uh, much more robust. But yeah, yeah, we can have some, some, some crisis. We have a technical recession in Thailand, a technical recession. So if we get in trouble again financially, uh, who do we turn to? Uh, would Uncle Sam uh, be more forthcoming this time? And, but, but more importantly, uh, that damage from the 1997 bailout, is, is, you know, is, is it re repairable? Can we do something about that? Uh, and then I think there was one more question about uh, expectations of partners, and anyone can answer that. Can we first, uh, the Army? Well, you have already answered most of the questions. I think the army is on weapon procurement have problems. I mean, uh, on the transparency and all that. But uh, one of the complaints I often heard is that if Singapore and Vietnam uh, can get better system than Thailand, what's the ally for? So whatever conditions that are uh, related to uh, the purchasing uh, would probably answer this question. So I think there's a sense of letdown uh, within the Thai military. I remember uh, maybe 15 years ago, Thailand wants AMRAM, and it took uh, forever, and it was a key issue. Certainly, um, transparency in weapon procurement has improving in the Thai military, I would say, because you have a budget in the parliament that's scrutiny, but it's not yet uh, 100%. Um, on, uh, second point, I think the expectation uh, between Thailand and US are exceptionally high because of the uh, time testing relation, O alliance, uh, and all that. And I think um, you need to dress down all this expectation. America is not going to help Thailand if we are in deep trouble like the way it used to. So we must have uh, look into our own strengths, find our own solution, making sure that uh, in absence of America assistance, we can survive. We cannot say that, oh, you know, if we have this problem, will America help us? No, I think we have to. Uh, overcome this uh, fear of U.S. dependency. And I think Thailand uh, uh, need a new mind, new thinking. I think country like Myanmar uh, has been able to manifest, uh, show that uh, uh, good decision, uh, decisive decision, very clear decision uh, is very useful. In the case of Thailand, uh, we has been able to preserve our foreign policy independence, so-called foreign policy independence and a national uh, integrity by uh, adopting a very uh, bamboo-like uh, policy, highly flexible. I think in this kind of environment, certain uh, clear policy, like the case of Syria, certain uh, policy direction that can say no to certain requests uh, outright with a very good explanation should serve Thailand interests better. Thailand cannot pursue a policy, be good friends to everybody at all time. Thank you. Uh, to take the question about, um, I guess, why did uh, the United States uh, was it uh, more receptive to assisting Indonesia and, and, and Korea? Um, part of it was is that uh, that legislation that I said that uh, prohibited the United States from helping Thailand uh, when the uh, crisis broke out in uh, July 2nd of, of uh, 1997. That um, legislation had a sunset uh, provision in it, and the uh, I believe the uh, the last day where 
you, they could not do anything uh, about that, whether it was Thailand or any other country, was October 31st. And if you look at when uh, the bailouts were for uh, Indonesia and then Korea, um, I, think Indo I think Indonesia was like November 1st, it was just right after it, and then uh, Korea not too long after that. But I was told by people that even in at that time, there were there were individuals saying, "Well, maybe we'll let Korea, who is also a very strong treaty ally, uh, maybe we should just let things take its course." And then there were some people, "No, no, they didn't know. What, you don't know what you're talking about. This is a much also bigger economy. This has even more significant repercussions." And so, um, I mean, fortunately, that uh, that did not happen. What would happen in the future? Um, I don't know. I don't. I, it, uh, you know. I think Goey is 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 right that uh, that's not to say that the U.S. and other countries wouldn't uh, try to come to be able to uh, provide some type of as assistance or support in some shape, way, or form. I, I'm not an economist, and I'm not trying to cop out on this, but I, I'm not sure I can really speak to the specifics of what it would be when I don't know exactly what exactly the problem is as well. Um, the uh, but I think Goey is right about, um, you know, we, you need to, you know, Thailand needs to look out for, uh, for itself. Uh, and in my initial comments, I, I said that, you know, Cha Chai Chunawan said that to Secretary Schlesinger in, in 1975. Um, so I think that in terms of what the expectation are, expectations are, I mean, clearly there's, there's something, there's something more that, you know, Thailand and hopefully the United States wants to derive out of the relationship. I think that's one of the reasons why the you know the four of us are, are on this panel now, and why Ambassador Kennedy uh, was here uh, uh, earlier this morning. Uh, I think the question is, or the challenge is, um, how do we um, how do we focus on this and that get to think about the relationship strategically, not only uh, for benefiting U.S.-Thailand relations, but also to uh, uh, benefit the, uh, the region, particularly main, mainland Southeast Asia, but ASEAN uh, as well. I just want to expand on the point of the lack of energy from Thailand in terms of this collaboration and relationship between the Thai and U.S. And I think Gun Gui also made a good point about the, the comments on the policymakers in Thailand. I can just give the example on the RMI because I have been looking at the RMI since it started in, 19, in sorry 2009, and Thailand hasn't been very active in this um, collaboration or this initiative. And I think the problem is with uh, some Thai policy makers because they don't see how to actually handle this. Of course, Thailand look at itself as a card provider in this region because we also provide some aid and money for the uh, countries like Laos and helping um, Cambodia with um, the construction of the road. And, but being a provider of the um, in the region, it doesn't mean that we cannot benefit from this, from this collaboration. And I just um, want to give you an example when I talked to um, a staff from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because when I was look, I was wondering why Thailand was not very active in our mind. And the answer that I heard is quite surprising me because they said, oh, because we are already competent and we are quite strong in the region. And of course we are, but not the whole country. If you look at people outside Thailand, outside Bangkok, we can see poverty. And if you look at, if you can't just, we, I don't think policy maker can just bet everything on statistic information. For example, in terms of education, if you look at the level of literacy in the country, 92.5% of Thai people, by implication that 92.5% of Thai people can read and write. But if you go to villages, you can see people who graduate or finish school cannot read and write. And the LMI also focus on, for example, education, health. And I think this is what Thailand can benefit from this relationship. But I'm not saying this to imply that Thailand should try to benefit or rely on the US, but on some area that we can benefit from that we should. But then on the other hand, that we should also 
try to rely on ourselves, as Kunika we mentioned. But the support from the US in some areas can help Thailand to be stronger and help the to support the other country in the region as well. Uh, please excuse my English. I was not a good question, but I have to <laughs> say to Kunkawi about the Cobra Gold. Two of us, uh, I met scholar at U.S. Staff College, Leavenworth in U.S. I used to think the same as Kunkawi. As a Cobra Gold, it's not really not benefit for a Thai military. But I changed my mind when I participated in Cobra Gold in 1999. And the second time is 2003 as a planning officer. Cobra Gold changed a lot from a two country participation to many countries participation. But there is a reason behind that to explain to Kunkawi. Security cooperation is one of the defense strategy of the Thailand. The purpose of security cooperation is to seek to fight the cooperation to protect any conflicts to initiate or explain it. So it means that to build the peace and stability in the regions. So the Cabo Gold is one of the mechanics to these defense strategies. Cobra Gold serve as the confidence building measure. We use a Cobra Gold as a bridge to cooperate amongst the countries participated, especially China and US. China was an observer the last until the present. In the future, you will see China participate in Cobra Gold. So one of the things that we did is the bridge to get them together so that covenant building measure will come up to that. We did one of the things between Thai, US, and Myanmar the last two weeks, if you saw on Channel 5. We helped US to get the bridge across to military the Myanmar military. That's as an actor of Ministry of Defense. So um, as I explained here, I'm sure Thailand will benefit from Cobra Gold. So we see security cooperation, we will see the peace and stability in the regions. And um, I'm sure I can speak English. And I'm sure every Cobra Gold we have the leader who can make a decision in a Cobra Gold. If the leader of Thai side is not good, the U.S. will put the comments on the paper, send it back to the Thai military. So I was the top of my class. He's the top of his class. So we participate in Cobra Gold. So I'll make sure you, sir, we get benefit from it. Thank you. Please. Okay, uh, I, I don't like to waste uh, the time of the forum, but uh, I have some, some my personal comment, maybe different from the colonel. Um, uh, Thai send the troops to the UN peacekeeping mission in Darfur, the country of the Republic of Sudan. And now we redeploy, uh, remove the troops tro tro from the Africa to, to, the, to the nations. I would say that the <coughs> When you look at the military performance, look at their the working, their output. Um, in the country of Sudan, they are the Arabic speaking country. The tri troop is, is one of the 18 infantry battalions deployed. It's just the one non African Union members country that deployed the mission. So the, the other 17, they are the African. Most of them use English as the back background, but uh, for Thai, maybe it's the very 
uh, very small English for the simple English. Not talk about the, my private or soldiers. Zero English maybe. But for the officer, we have some English, simple English up to, and we have some interpreters. But what, what one thing, one day, the force commander from the country of Rwanda spoke in the meeting that he preferred all of the 17 battalions English-speaking countries, speak English-speaking veterans, to be like a Thai battalion because their professionalism could organize this penalty that show as a accept, acceptable in, in the mission. And I remember that uh, the mission asked the, the UN in New York. So after that, the uh, uh, Secretary General, the Mr. Ban Ki-moon, called to the Prime Minister Ying Lan to reconsider about the removing, uh, redeploy of the Thai troops to reconsider. Uh, unfortunately, finally, we redeployed the troops back, back to Thailand. So uh, when you look back at two years ago, the flood in Bangkok, I think it's many people in Bangkok, I think it's the first one that you held you to the Jurangon, my way, Jurangon University, maybe the, the mini trucks. Thank you. Let me say this, a uh, couple ago, what I said is that Thailand should benefit more. You were the exceptional, you will benefit because you speak excellent English. And I used the word speaking English as a mother of her. Do not, I'm not looking down on anyone. You are excellent. Oh, Thai has done a great job on peacekeeping. What can I say? But the point here is, you are the exceptional Thailand. Thai military need to think, I succeed today. You have spoke out, I'm so happy. Now, with your exceptional uh, experience from Kobago, how many people? We need to have the senior official read the report from the Kobago that you get the first class, that we know how to use the computer in central command headquarters in Chiang Mai and know what's going on. Excellent. That's what I want. But the problem is, copper gold does not benefit Thailand 100%. We should. That's my point. Well, I'm very happy you were the exceptional case. You're top of your class. I met as a, that's why I said I met is so important. That's why I said copper gold is so important. We need a clone like you in the Thai military. We love it. I think that's a very important. Thank you for your a clarification. Yeah, I'd just like to point out that there has been tremendous change in Thailand, and I came the first time in 1986. Thailand today is now considered an upper, upper middle income country, and we know that in many ways, as one of my colleagues said to me one time, there's a question about whether you'd really consider Thailand a developing country anymore, and that was 15 years ago, and I thought, wow, that's just a different way to think about Thailand. But when you become an upper middle income country, whether you're the United States in the 1890s, as we emerged as a great power, or Thailand today, you have to think about the way you uh, do things and maybe change some of those ways of doing things. And I think IMET might be a good example, and I know this from having worked at the Army War College. Yes, we, the United States can provide funding for IMET, but it's also true that many countries pay for their students to attend senior service colleges and other training. So the question then becomes, at what point does Thailand begin to think about different ways of obtaining the results that it wants in its relationship, not only with the United States, but with other countries? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take that as the last comment. Uh, please join me in thanking the speakers, and thank you for coming.